So I'm going to be covering motivation and emotion. Um, and then at the end of the class, I will give you some time, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how much time I'm, I'm going to take, for you to write a reflection of today's class. Now, you will not be allowed to ha have your notes or slides in front of you, because I don't want you to just copy from the PowerPoints that you printed out. Okay, so I want you to write from your memory, uh, and I want you to think about the material on your own. So start working your brains while I'm teaching. All right, the first part is motivation, and motivation does um, relate to emotions. As you can see later on when we're, I'm talking about um, aggression, um, there are certain emotional expressions that come with aggression, etc. But let's start with the definition of why is it that our behaviors are motivated. Because there's this drive in our bodies, there's this internal tension in our bodies that causes us to want to reduce this drive and this leads to our behaviors being motivated. We behave in a certain way for a reason. Okay? And our behaviors are motivated because these behavi behaviors uh, serve to reduce a drive and return us to equilibrium so that our bodies are not 24 hours uh, in, a highly tense, uh, in a highly tense state. Okay? We're not in tension for uh, all the time. So that's the whole point of the drive reduction. So you start off with a drive, a state of internal bodily tension. It could be something like being hungry, being scared, and then you exhibit certain behaviors that serve to reduce this drive. You want to stop your hunger. You want to stop your fear. In order for you to reduce this drive and put your body back into equilibrium, okay? So just to elaborate a bit more on equilibrium, um, the reason why we need to go back to a state of equilibrium is because the body does have the tendency to maintain the conditions of its internal environment. The body knows how to self-regulate so that you're not always stressed, you're not always tense, okay? Um, and it leads to the body being in a homeostasis state, okay? That's the, the, the process through which the body self-regulates so that um, you maintain the conditions um, that are good for the functioning of your body. And how does the body maintain internal equilibrium? Well, it does internal adjustments as well as exhibiting a diverse set of behavior. So for example, when you're low on calories, you feel hunger. You feel the urge to reduce this hunger, this drive. So you eat, very simply put. So for exa examples of drive would be hunger, thirst. When you're feeling thirsty, you would seek water to reduce this thirst um, so that your body feels uh, normal again. The need for sleep um, is also a drive and you're motivated to sleep to reduce the sleepiness, again, to put your body back into a, a normal state, okay? Now, one of the examples of motivation, you might not think of motivation in terms of threat and aggression. To you, motivation uh, has a lot to do with your academic uh, performance, whether or not you're motivated to do well, whether or not you're motivated to come to class, whether or not you're motivated to attend a club, things like that. So you might rarely think of motivation in terms of threat and aggression. Well, intense threat um, is an example where the motive depends on uh, primarily on external triggers, an external factor. So for example, a predator coming after you, or a lion pre preparing to pounce on you, uh, or on another animal. And in response to this threat, our bodies make numerous internal adjustments that are controlled by complex uh, regulatory mechanisms. Okay, our body doesn't just stay in the same state. We feel this threat and our body starts working to reduce uh, this response or respond to this threat accordingly. Now, there are genetic mechanisms. Some of us are just born to be able to deal with threat more easily than others. Okay, we don't feel particularly scared uh, compared with others. We don't feel particularly um, threatened, um, terrified, 
or we don't sweat as much as others when we perceive threat. But um, genetic factors might not be very relevant if environmental factors play a stronger role or experiences. For example, uh, people who have to, uh, those zookeepers who have to deal with the very dangerous animals at the zoo, um, because they face these threats on a daily basis, through their experience, they're less likely to respond to lions or cobra snakes in the same way as we do, because they have the experience of being exposed to this threat. Now, when we are reacting to threat and aggression, as I said earlier, the body does some internal adjustments to prepare the body to respond to the threat and aggression. Sorry, through the threat. Um, so for example, the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, the ANS, summons the body. Okay, it kind of gets the body ready, um, collecting or commanding the body's resources in times of crisis and readies the organism. So it could be human, it could be animal, uh, for vigorous action. The point is, when you're facing a threat, you want to act quickly. Now, in a normal state, your body wouldn't allow you to do that. So the body has to adjust make adjustments accordingly so that you can run if you have to run very, very quickly. Okay? Um, the adrenal medulla um, involves a stimulation that induces the release of epinephrine, so adrenaline, feeling a rush of adrenaline when you're in crisis or when you're very excited, and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. Okay? And it accelerates the heart rate, so your heart rate is accelerated, so when you feel threat, your heart beats faster. It speeds up metabolism. You burn your calories faster. You burn energy faster. So sometimes uh, after a particular threat, you might feel exhausted because um, you were burning calories or burning energy much uh, faster when you are reacting to threat. Um, and this, all these processes amplify the sympathetic effects even further. Okay, so your body... Um, is constantly preparing to react to this um, threat. Now, one of the uh, very common or popular theories in relation to reactions to threat is the fight or flight response uh, by Cannon. And basically, it refers to this intense sympathetic arousal, as I uh, discussed earlier, that serves as an emergency reaction, okay, as I said your body in a normal state cannot react to threat properly. It won't necessarily, or it cannot save your life. Um, the body has to be adjusted for that to happen, to mobilize you for crisis. And what this, um, this internal uh, process does, it allows more nutrients to, um, uh, to be available to your body, to, especially to your muscles, okay? because for you to escape, your muscles need to be at its peak um, performance, and the nutrients can be delivered rapidly through white uh, bloody vessels. Now, at the same time, because your body can't do everything at once, uh, while it's um, producing nutrients to the muscles, it has to stop certain other bodily processes. So at the same time, uh, waste products like um, tears, okay, um, or salivation. Why is it when we feel very scared, when we feel threat, our mouth seems very dry, we feel like we're very thirsty, we need a drink? It's because your body, while preparing your muscles, would stop things like uh, tearing, okay, liu yan lei, or um, salivation. Okay? So at the same time, waste products are jettisoned, meaning they're kind of, meaning they're kind of halted, stopped. And any other bodily activities that are less useful for this escape or fight, fighting or flight uh, response are brought to a halt. Now, the reason why you might show this fight or flight response um, is for survival purposes. Because if your body is not ready for action, then you are not able to fight or escape. Now, there are problems with the fight or flight formulation because it doesn't explain certain situations or certain uh, responses to threat. For example, organisms respond to threat in many different ways. There are some animals that stand immobile so that predators are less likely to notice them. Okay, they don't really show a very significant fight or flight response. So for example, the tortoise or turtle, 
that stay still in its shell. Um, and their response is to uh, prevent the predators from noticing them or being less likely to notice them. And in some other cases, animals change colors, which is neither fight or flight. They camouflage themselves. Okay? So there is a slight problem with this fight or flight formulation. It doesn't seem to explain um, why there are so many ways we can respond to threat. Another um, problem with the fight or flight response is that how we respond to threats seem to vary by gender. It seems like females um, respond to stressful situations. Now, think of uh, situations of war, okay, in conflict. Females tend to respond to stressful situations by tending, by taking care of. So they're neither fighting or escaping. Okay? They're taking care of children or providing social support. And another problem with the fight or flight formulation is that the arousal of the sympathetic branch of the ANS can also be disruptive and damaging. So that means although our body is able to prepare itself for intense threat at a particular time, it is not able to cope with long-term stress. So chronic means long-term stresses. For example, domestic violence. Okay, because if the body keeps prepping itself um, like that, stopping some essential bodily activities, the body is not able to cope with these internal responses for, uh, in the long term. And this becomes damaging to the body. Okay, being exposed to long term stress, like uh, a threatening spouse or any other chronic stresses uh, at work, for example. Now, threat. It's often seen, you can see a lot of these cases in real life, as a motive for aggression. Okay? I act aggressively because I see you as a threat or I see your behavior as a threat. And organisms, um, humans or animals, engage in two forms of uh, violence, predation and aggression. And there are distinct differences between predation uh, and aggression. A predatory attack that is hunting and killing for food, um, is motivated by hunger. Okay, it's rarely motivated by aggression. And it's controlled by the same brain areas as eating. Another unique aspect of predation that makes it different from aggression is there are no signs of anger when uh, an organism is um, killing, hunting and killing for food. So, for example, when you observe animals uh, hunting and killing for food, you almost never see them growl before attacking their prey. They growl uh, when they're getting into a fight over territory, but not when they are um, hunting and killing for food. Now, aggression, on the other hand, is motivated by threat. Okay? Aggression is not motivated by hunger. And it's triggered by different situations. So, for example, someone might hit me. I might respond to that. Uh, someone might take my belongings. I might respond to that aggressively. And aggressive or self-defense behaviors are not controlled by uh, the brain areas to do with eating. Okay? They are controlled by different brain areas, making aggression uh, very different from predation. Okay? Even the underlying brain sites are different. Also, aggression. Um, shows different kinds, uh, you can see aggression in many different ways. Okay, predation is a lot more straightforward. The animal goes in for the kill, for food. But aggression, we humans certainly show aggression in very different ways. We could use physical aggression. We could beat up someone. We could use a weapon. We could also use verbal aggression, swearing, shouting, screaming, uh, psychologically torturing someone verbally. We could also show social exclusion. That's also another form of aggression. So think about all the different types of bullying. Uh, I think that's one of the best ways to understand uh, the different types of aggression. Okay? All the different types of bullying. Now, um, there's something unique about male aggression um, and 
it looks like among vertebrates, the male is by far the more physically aggressive sex. Remember, physically aggressive, okay? As adults, um, of course, this is kind of more based on the figures in the US. Male murderers do outnumber females by a ratio of 10 to 1. That seems to be the trend. Okay? It's much more common to uh, see male murderers than female murderers. Oh, I thought you were going to raise your hand to, to, to uh, protest. Um, however, this gender difference only holds for physical aggression. Okay? Human females are also aggressive. Um, I will show you one, one uh, video clip in a bit. But their aggression tends to rely on <laughs> verbal or social assaults. Okay? So if you think about how many of you have actually witnessed uh, bullying in school? Witness first. No? Oh, wow. What schools did you go to? Why, why, why are you so shy about it? Uh, is, okay, how many of you have been victims of bullying? There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with being a victim of bullying, you know? Uh, people bully for every reason. You cannot even imagine. Um, so think about the different types of bullying at school, okay? The ones that often go on the news are the ones that beat each other up. But they rarely talk about this type, verbal assaults social assaults, and victims actually sometimes suffer a lot more, they would rather take the physical uh, than to take the verbal. Because verbal can be very psychology torturing, psychological torture. Social assaults would be more to do with social exclusion, okay? making sure that you never make a friend in school, or making sure that uh, online, on Facebook, everyone knows uh, your problem, or everyone knows your weakness, things like that. Um, now, if we focus on these sorts of aggression, now especially cyberbullying is, is a very big issue now, then it looks like women, not men, are the aggressive sex. So should we blame the testosterone? It's because of the male hormone that makes them so physically aggressive. Now, high testosterone levels are associated with increased physical aggression in many different species, but not for all situations or contexts. Basically, testosterone levels does not explain why um, humans behave aggressively in certain situations. Uh, so it must be due to other factors. And high testosterone levels can also be both a cause and effect of aggressive behavior. That means um, you might act aggressively because you have high testosterone levels, or uh, you might start off with a not so high testosterone level but because you constantly engage in aggressive behaviors. So let's say, for example, uh, boys growing up in very dangerous neighborhoods where aggression is a way to survive. Now, they might start off with, they might have this uh, inherited uh, lower testosterone level, but this constant uh, involvement in aggressive activities might actually lead them to have higher testosterone levels. So we can't tell whether it's a cause or effect of aggressive behavior, okay? So it's inaccurate to say that testosterone causes aggression in all species. Now, there are cognitive um, aspects of threat and aggression that helps us understand why we behave aggressively or why others behave aggressively. So we have to think about it in terms of the sources of aggression uh, or the reasons for aggression, okay? So for example, securing resources or maintaining a hold on what they think is theirs. Another source of aggression is uh, related to symbolic concerns, okay, such as insults to honor um, or objections to another person's belief or behavior. How about revenge? You, you know, we watch, uh, well, okay, I watch, I watch a lot of um, those old movies, right? The Asian movies where Let's not talk about the gangsters. Let's talk about the, those old traditional families. One family member is killed. They go after um, the other family for revenge. You insulted my family or something like that. Okay? That's probably more symbolic because um, there are no resources involved in there. Now, because we all become aggressive 
at one point or another for different reasons. There are individual, also the individual differences in aggression. Why is it some of us are more easily provoked? Why is it some of us are more easily motivated by threat? Why is it some of us are more intense when we act aggressively um, than others? Now, what are the individual differences in aggression? One of them seems to be unrealistic high self-esteem. Okay? Um, social provocations are much more likely to inspire or to cause aggression if the person who is provoked has unrealistically high self-esteem. Uh, they really think they, they are really good in a certain aspect um, or something else. And the person is particularly likely to perceive the provocation as a grievous assault. And it challenges, they perceive this provocation as challenging their inflated self-image. Okay, because they ha they're overly confident, so their self-image is inflated. And because they have this uh, unrealistic high self-esteem, any minor provocation, it might, we might not react very strongly to it, but this person will be more likely to be violent. Uh, towards the person provoking him or her. Well, of course, another would be an inherent uh, aggressiveness. Okay? Some of us are just um, born to be aggressive across the board. Some of us become only aggressive when we are really provoked. Now, remember when I showed you um, early in the semester the little boy bullying the bigger boy? Okay? The teacher seemed to say, well, the big boy is rarely aggressive. There was one time when he was aggressive that he went all the way, okay, flipping the, the other kid onto the ground. Um, other people tend to feel and display a lot of anger, but it seems to translate into aggression only when they are provoked. Okay, some people look angry all the time, or they seem very unhappy um, all the time, but they only show aggression when they are provoked. So there are many different ways in which we express aggression and many different ways in which we use aggression. Some of them are um, genetic, some of them are environmentally uh, caused. Okay? Now, there also seems to be um, a relationship between aggression and sensation seeking. Sensation seeking is the tendency to seek out uh, varied, meaning many different kinds of experiences or novel, new experiences um, in their daily lives. These are people who are adventurous, okay, who like to try new things, or who cannot stick to the same thing uh, all the time. Uh, these kind of people look for thrills and adventures, and they're highly susceptible to boredom. They get bored very easily. And some research shows that high levels of sensation seeking are associated with aggressiveness. Impulsivity is also related to aggression and explains why we are so different in terms of the aggression we show. Some of us are more impulsive than others. Okay? Some of us tend to act without really thinking about our actions. And high scores on tests of impulsivity seems to be associated with aggressiveness. Of course, a lot of people are talking about cultural aspects of threat and aggression. Okay? Some cultures are more violent than others. Now, one example from the US would be the Quaker community. Um, how many of you have heard of the Quaker community? Okay, what do you know about the Quaker community? They wear very traditional clothes. They wear uh, almost as if in they're from the uh, 1800s, I think, or early 1900s. Okay, now they're known to be a very uh, non-violent community, very peace-loving. They do their own things. They're usually involved in agricultural activities, and they're usually in uh, very rural parts of the U.S. because they want to be isolated. Now, in the U.S., the homicide rate uh, in the South, for example is reliably higher than in the north. Of course, it's important uh, to bear in mind that it's not due to population density. Just because it's a highly urban area doesn't mean necessarily mean that people are more aggressive. Um, and it's also not necessarily related to economic conditions or climate, but more to do with social differences, perhaps the culture, cultural values, whether aggression is uh, a valid uh, method to solve uh, conflicts, to solve uh, 
problems, etc. Think about the cultural differences in how we respond to provocation and cultural differences in tolerance. These two go together. Okay, in some cultures, yeah, we are not encouraged to, or we almost just try to suppress our unhappiness or our dissatisfaction if, even if someone shouts at me, um, I don't fight back. Because in my culture, um, just walk away. That's usually the, the strategy. That's usually the advice, uh, that you don't fight back. Well, how does culture encourage or discourage aggression? Okay? Under explicit teaching, parents telling us not to be aggressive uh, or, and punish aggressive acts or the other way around. When I taught bullying in New York, my students told me, um, I, I taught in a, a college where I had a lot of students coming from immigrant families. Okay, they, are, they come from not privileged families. And they tell me that their parents train them to fight back if they are bullied at school. Uh, girls too. The fathers would train the girls to fight, you know, wrestle and, and punch at home uh, so that they, they can cope with... Because many immigrant children are bullied um, because of their status. So their parents train them to cope, to survive, uh, having moved to the U.S. by being physically able to fight back. So it could work both ways. Um, there are also subtle cues okay, um, that contribute to aggression via culture. We pick up on subtle cues um, that tell us whether people think that aggression is acceptable or unacceptable. Okay, but by watching what um, other people in our culture behave, uh, or what they think of how we behave, we, we behave accordingly. Okay, if I behave aggressively, and people in my culture view me in a different way, or view me negatively, then I would change my behavior accordingly. Observational learning. People around us model through their own actions how one should handle situations that might provoke aggression. If someone is just shouting at you, uh, you walk away, someone hits you, perhaps you don't fight back, but you call the police instead, or you ask for help instead. Or perhaps in your culture, when someone hits you, um, it's very likely that other people around you will come and help you, for example. So different uh, societies, different cultures have different ways of handling um, provocations or provoking situations. Any thoughts about those? Let, let me hold that thought. Remember what we saw? Okay. Now, anyway, investigators estimate that the average American child observes more than 10,000 acts of TV violence every year. And studies consistently show that assault and homicide rates increase after exposure to media violence. Think about the questions we might have about this. Studies also indicate that children who are not particularly aggressive become more so after viewing TV violence. However, it could work the other way around, that watching TV violence makes us aggressive. But it could also be that we watch TV violence because we are already aggressive. So we seek out these kinds of uh, stimuli or these kinds of uh, visual entertainment uh, to satisfy our aggressive uh, nature. Okay? Any thoughts about the effects of media violence? Now let's focus on the, the video games. Okay? Um, people, uh, kids or adults all over the world play the same video games. Why is it some people don't change or don't necessarily become aggressive with the constant exposure to a violent video game like shooting up people every day, but some kids do show more aggressive behavior in school? The teachers notice that something changed. Now, how many parents know what their kids are playing? Is well, my that's, question. That's different than <laughs> yes, there are age regulations. The same, there are age limits for uh, movies, for TV shows, etc. And for example, TV shows like TV in Taiwan, the violent films, uh, like Taiwan likes to show those gangster films from Hong Kong. Um, and I usually see them, no, I don't watch them, but it's, the TV was on. Um, the gangster films were on late at night. So there was another strategy to prevent uh, young children from watching these films, age limit and all that. But in many cases, parents actually don't know what their kids are being exposed to. Or they don't realize how bad it is. 
or am I wrong? For, for example, those who play video games in Taiwan, how young did you start? Okay, you might not want to tell me. <laughs> seven. seven. Now, was it something violent? Yes. Yes. Okay. Did your parents know? Yes. Yes. Any ways that they... Why do you think that you're not as affected by the violence? Oh, well, I assume that you're not affected by the violence. <laughs> Did your parents say something? Did your, no? No, no, Okay. Did you do other peace-loving activities? Other <laughs> what? Did you do other peace-loving activities to balance out this? Why is it some of us can dissociate from the violence? Why is it some of us can embrace this violence? Now, let's go back to one, one very big case, the Columbine School Massacre in the US. Okay, a very, I think this was 1993 or something like that, where uh, two, two boys, two teenage boys, um, shot many students to death at the high school. And it was later found that somehow they created a scenario, a custom game in Doom. Um, and what they did at the school was exactly the same as this custom, you know some games you can create a custom map? 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 Well, they had no, different... Okay, don't, don't worry me, um, but um, yeah, they, they created this custom game. So a lot of people from then on were saying um, kids are, try, are transferring all this violence they, they uh, create, they contribute to, because you are actually part of the violence in a video game, and bringing it to a, a, a situation they think is hostile to them. So they might have seen the school as a hostile situation to them, and they felt the need to respond in the same way as they did in the video game. Okay, so this is very highly debatable. Okay, definitely. Uh, I, I, I really think that happens in many cases, that a lot of kids are aggressive because they are being victims of aggression. Either they're already being bullied at school and they're channeling their, their, this hostility, this anger, this violence, this aggression somewhere else, or um, in many cases, kids who witness domestic violence is a very common research finding that children who uh, witness domestic violence uh, in the long term be, do uh, show higher aggressiveness than other children. So as you said, real life contributes to uh, the aggression in, for example, or seeking out aggressive uh, material, aggressive media, or violent media. Okay? So, but is aggression inevitable? Okay? It depends on a different situation. You wouldn't expect, well, okay, there are some cases where we see a cat trying to fight a dog. Um, but in most cases, they do try to run rather than fight with a, a bulldog, for example. And this is because of the natural selection uh, process that tries to uh, limit the damages done by aggression by ensuring that we are sensitive to the strength of their enemies. Okay? We have to... Uh, measure our capability of responding to this threat. If the enemy seems much stronger than oneself, then the best strategy is to concede defeat, to give up and run, okay, rather than fight when you know you won't survive the battle at all. So the best hope in reducing human aggression, by not only by looking cute pictures every day, but uh, also to have a moral reflection and intellectual reflection of the um, consequences of violence, um, which will pull us away from war, for example, and help us reconcile our differences. This is kind of the more philosophical part. All right, yeah? I taught students who came from, as I said, said, not very privileged backgrounds. I had many students who came to class and then rushed to, do, to work. And then um, my college offers night classes because that's the only time many of the students could, could study. I have students who do undergrad for seven years because they, she has to work. Uh, uh, she's a single mom of three children. She has to work, take care of the three kids, study, because she knows if she doesn't get the degree, she's not going to go anywhere. Um, she ha can only work certain jobs. Okay? So there are motivations uh, that vary, and we'll see the kinds of goals that motivate us. Positive goals like um, things that we seek and enjoy, like watching a sunrise or going to a concert, the more <coughs> romantic aspects uh, of positive goals. 
And there are two major motives that govern our daily activities. Okay? Motive to belong to our groups. This is very much social psychology, which I'll teach soon. And the motive to achieve, which you can definitely uh, relate to. Motives to belong include avoidance orientation and approach orientation. Avoidance or orientation refers to us not wanting to be alone or rejected, so we take steps to avoid these ex uh, experiences. Okay? So for example, I'm motivated to join clubs. I'm motivated to set up a Facebook page so that I am able to connect more to people and are less likely to feel lonely. Approach orientation. I seek out the benefits of being with others, um, including the positive emotion experience in social interactions. I actively go to parties, I actively, actively go to social activities, join extracurricular activities because I enjoy being with other people, not because I want to avoid being lonely. Of course, there are many cases when these two go hand in hand. Okay? Benefits of social context, the reason why we seek um, the company of others, it could be for tangible support. Okay, we get practical help from many different people. If I want to learn baking, I join the baking club and I get practical help from others. People who are better at baking will teach me how to improve my skills or joining a, a sports club, etc. It also, uh, so another example would be getting help proofreading an assignment. So I might make friends for a particular reason. It's not necessarily bad, but I get practical help from it. Emotional support, okay, some of us seek the company of others. We make friends so that we can go to someone when we're upset, when we're unhappy, when we are stressed. Um, a direct support would be a friend consoling us. Okay? When we seek direct support, we have someone sitting with us, hearing us, um, listening to us, uh, uh, advising us, and comforting us. Indirect would be the emotional connections we have to others. I don't feel as nervous, I don't feel as worried because I know my classmates feeling the same. So you feel this emotional connection is an indirect uh, support. The motive to achieve, again, there are these two types of orientation. Avoidance orientation would be you try to achieve because you fear failing. Okay? And these are the kinds of people who are less likely to seek out challenges. Okay? They want to achieve by reducing the chances of failing. So they're less likely to look for challenges where there is a risk for failing. Uh, on the other hand, there are some people who have the approach orientation. They desire to succeed and they're not uh, afraid of seeking out challenges and excelling when the going gets tough. These are people who rise beyond the challenge, uh, cope and rise beyond the challenge. And achievement motivation is a powerful uh, predictor of school performance, as some of you might already uh, know or experience. Now, there are factors, cultural, environmental, also genetic, um, that of motives to achieve. Okay? For example, parenting style. This probably hits home to, uh, for many of you. There is some evidence that caregivers, so parents or sometimes grandmothers or babysitters, anyone who is caring for the child, who punishes failure and takes success for granted can instill a fear of failure uh, in, in children. And as they grow older, this might carry on. Um, there's also a parenting style that rewards achievement but not punish failure. Um, and this kind of parenting style can promote a more positive desire for success. Okay, so elites, these two will contribute to these two different types of orientation. Now, there are cognitive factors involved in the motivation to achieve. Mastery orientation or performance orientation. In mastery orientation, there is a focus on learning and improving. Okay? Um, when someone is a master orientated, the person would focus on learning all the material um, and improving. So sometimes seeking out challenges to test their own skills. And in face of difficulty or adversity, uh, an individual who is mastery orientated would be likely to increase effort and seek out ways of benefiting from the experience. In performance orientation, the individual focuses on performing well and looking smart 
or avoiding failure and not looking stupid or not looking, uh, uh, as not looking like a failure. In face of difficulty or negative feedback, this person is likely to withdraw effort uh, and shift focus elsewhere. Okay, so these two kinds of orientations are quite uh, different. Now, motivation can also be understood in terms of the hierarchy of needs. Why is it we're motivated to do certain things uh, and not others? It, because it depends on what we need at that moment in time. And Maslow proposes uh, the hierarchy of needs that govern our motivation. Okay, starting uh, at the bottom with very basic needs. These are physiological needs, like eating um, or sleeping, things like that, resting. Then safety needs, to make sure that we are in a safe environment. Esteem needs, doing things um, to improve our confidence or to contribute to our confidence. And then self-actualization, to promote our self-identity. Okay, this is who I am. Uh, this is what I have achieved things like that. Now typically, people will only go for the higher order needs, so they only do things to um, fulfill their self-esteem or self-actualization when their lower ones, the basic needs, are fulfilled. Okay, usually you start off from the bottom and you move upwards. Once you have fed yourself well, you slept well, you rested well, then you work on fulfilling these higher order needs. However, there are exceptions. For example, people on hunger strikes, it's the inverse. Okay? They look for self-actualization and then uh, foregoing or neglecting or refusing to satisfy their biological needs, their basic needs, so that they can express what they think, uh, express what they want. Okay, people who go on hunger strikes who protest for a cause, for a reason. Also, starving artists and martyrs. Okay? Artists who do not eat for days so that they can complete their work of art, for example. So these are scenarios where it doesn't go from bottom up. Okay? It goes from top down. Um, they would forego their basic needs so that they can fulfill their top, uh, the self-actualization or esteem needs. Can you give me other examples? where some people would try to fulfill the higher order needs and neglecting or refusing uh, their basic needs. So I've shown you uh, people who go on hunger strike, so not eating. How about not sleeping? Not sleeping to do what? Not, not sleeping to study, yeah? Not sleeping to study, that would be one example. Any other examples? Suicide bomber. Suicide bomber, yeah. They would completely um, reject their safety needs and physiological needs, okay, living and, uh, well, safety, in order to uh, promote their beliefs, their ideology, yeah? Any other examples? Fasting for prayer, Fasting for prayer so for religion, yeah? Okay. I'm going to skip the discussion. Okay, so that was motivation. And we will see why um, motivation and emotion uh, would be related. Okay, so this is just a quick warm-up. Now, when we're talking about emotions, I'm not focusing too much on the different kinds of emotions that we start showing from young until um, adulthood. But just to give you an idea about the functions and the way we regulate emotions and uh, certain basic emotions. Emotions serve uh, interpersonal functions. Okay? Emotions actually make our interactions meaningful. Um, it's very different for me to talk to you without any emotional expression 
and you not responding with any emotion, comparing with if I'm smiling at you and you smile back. Okay, that's a whole different meaning altogether. Expressions of emotion can indicate social intent. When I smile or when we smile, we indicate that we are open to interacting with other people. Or there might be other reasons. We're smiling because we are happy, or we're smiling, uh, that I'm ha we're smiling because we're happy uh, in your company, or we're smiling because we're happy to be here with certain uh, people, etc. Expressions of emotion can also facilitate group functioning. When we show embarrassment, we indicate to other people that we know we have made a mistake. Or uh, our show of embarrassment has the effect of making amends for a mistake. Because we're embarrassed, we know that what we've done is something wrong or is a mistake. And it shows the intention or anticipation that we are going to change uh, so that we won't further cause this embarrassment. Okay? Now, what are the different perspectives on how we, uh, how we develop emotions? Because it seems like all of us are born with the ability to express emotions. Now, according to the genetic maturation of perspective, emotions are products of biological factors. Okay? So, for example, temperament, our temperament determines how intense our reactions to emotionally arousing situations are and how we regulate their reactions. So if I am by nature a very calm person, I am less likely to look very scared uh, when there is a threat compared with a person who is uh, generally less calm than myself. Okay? And a certain amount of physical maturation and social stimulation has to occur before a baby starts to smile. Okay? We, start, we smile more when we have people to smile at. We smile more when uh, people around us show more positive facial expressions. If we grow up with people who rarely show positive emotional expressions, we are less likely to be reinforced uh, and we're less likely to do so. Okay? Now, the evidence comes from uh, studies that show most full-term babies begin to smile at about six weeks and premature babies born at 36 weeks smile at about 12 weeks. So all of us are able to smile at some point. But when we start to smile and when we smile more depends on the context. Okay? So we have the biological basis to do so. And the learning perspective complements this, meaning that um, the reason why we start smiling at different ages, we smile at different frequencies. Some of us smile a lot, some of us don't. Um, we smile at different intensities. Some of us have a little smile. Some of us usually have a very big smile. Um, it's because we are influenced by the context in which we are raised. Okay? For example, how many times or the frequency with which children smile and laugh is influenced by the environment in which they were raised. So if they grew up in a very high conflict home, they grow up with parents who always fight, they're much, much less likely to show positive uh, emotions than other children. Parents can also influence emotions by dismissing uh, emotional uh, expressions and experiences. For example, certain parents don't encourage children to uh, laugh very loud or scream happily. Okay? They might be told off. They might punish them for showing too much positive expressions uh, or showing too much negative expressions. Okay, so for example, uh, a parent might say, well, if you're unhappy, don't show me your angry face. Okay, dismissing their angry face, uh, inhibiting their negative expressions. Mm -hmm. Fears can also be learned by operant conditioning, as I taught you before, uh, through imitation. Children might um, be conditioned to show more fear as they live in a context that has more fear compared with other children, or teenagers or adults. The functionist perspective um, proposes that emotions help us achieve our goals. Our emotions have functions. Okay? For example, we feel fear that leads us to run from a scary situation. Okay? This emotion may, uh, helps us survive. Um, it, helps, it enables us to achieve the goal of self-preservation. And information provided by other people's emotional signals guide our behavior. So for example, 
um, positive feedback from a potential friend would encourage us to continue with the friendship. So if I'm trying to make friends with a new person and this person is constantly smiling at me, it's a signal to me that, okay, I think our relationship will work. We are able to become friends. Compared with a new, a strange person who does not show me any emotional expressions or who does not show me any positive expressions, that would be a signal to me that, okay, this friendship is not going to work. Okay, so emotions serve some kind of functions. And memories of, past, of the past, our memories of our lives in the past, do shape future responses to similar situations. Okay? How much I smile to a stranger may depend on my previous experiences with a stranger. Maybe I have never been able to really uh, continue with a friendship as easily before. So I'm less likely, I'm more shy with strangers in the future because I haven't had a positive experience before that. Okay. So let me quickly go through the very basic emotions um, that we show from young and how that um, carries on to adulthood. In the first few weeks of life, babies show reflex or simple smiles. Um, their smiles are not as clear as we would see on adults and they're usually spontaneous and depend on the child's infant states. Because they're so young, they usually smile because somehow they feel comfortable uh, or they're sleeping or they're dreaming. Between three to eight weeks, infants begin to smile to external factors. You can start seeing babies smiling to the caregiver, smiling to social stimuli, like seeing a face, hearing a voice, uh, etc. And by about three months, babies start to smile more selectively uh, at familiar faces. Okay? Their emotions are targeted towards certain stimuli. Their emotions change according to certain stimuli. And babies also display genuine smiles more in interacting with caregivers than when smiling alone. Genuine smiles are usually indicated by smiling with both the mouth and the eyes. Okay? You can really see them communicating with the caregiver rather than when they are on their own. Of course, there are some individual differences that relate to um, social responsiveness of the baby's environment. And there are gender differences as well in smiling. Um, newborn and teenage girls smile more than their male counterparts in general. There also seems to be ethnic differences or nationality differences. Children and adults in US and Canada show larger gender differences in smiling than those in the UK. African-American girls and boys show smaller differences in smiling behavior. It means that uh, compared with um, Caucasian American or white American girls and boys, when you compare African-American girls and boys, their smiling uh, doesn't differ a lot. There's very little difference between girls and boys in the terms of their smiling. And the hypothesis is, the, the reason that people are proposing is that parents in the African-American culture treat boys and girls more similarly than uh, European-American parents do. Okay? Now, at the same time as positive uh, emotions like smiling, um, babies also start to show negative emotions. So the classic case would be when you put the baby into a stranger's arms and they show intense fear or maybe not so much fear, but um, babies learn to be fearful. They learn to be scared of some events and some people. They might not like to go out or they might really like to go out. Um, but many babies show fear or uh, discomfort with unfamiliar people. Okay? And the fear of strangers or wariness of strangers uh, at three months can be seen also in fear at seven to eight months. Now, not all babies show fear towards strangers. It depends on the culture. Some cultures, babies are constantly exposed to unfamiliar people, to strangers. So you're less likely to see stranger wariness um, in uh, that culture. And the variations in how children are scared of stranger also depends on who the stranger is, uh, how or she behaves, or the context in which the stranger is encountered. So babies who see an unfamiliar person outside home might be more fearful 
than babies who see the unfamiliar person in their homes. Okay? It depends on whether or not the context is familiar. I'm actually going to skip anger and sadness because I want to focus more on um, the different uh, processes of, of emotions. Recognizing emotions in others. Yes, we are all born to be able to express emotions. How about reading other people's emotions? Now, in mother-infant face-to-face interactions, babies recognize positive emotions more frequently than negative emotions. So when we're young, we are more likely to recognize smiling, laughing, ha- being happy than um, uh, negative emotions such as anger, sadness, um, etc. And the nature of the early experience, um, that means the kinds of experience the, babies, uh, the baby is exposed to or the interaction between parents. Does the baby see a lot of negativity between the parents or a lot of positivity? Uh, these are the different kinds of experiences that predict whether the child is able to recognize emotions. And how well we read people's emotions when we're children does carry on to adulthood. And the recognition and production of emotions are related. If we're able to recognize what other people are feeling, we're also um, better able to produce appropriate emotions depending on the situations. And this is related to the ability uh, called social referencing. That is the process of reading emotional cues in others to help determine how we should act in a situation. If I see that my friend is feeling very sad, it would be inappropriate for me to laugh. Okay? So I need to be able to read emotional cues in other people to determine how I should respond. Likewise, if someone is very happy, Um, it would be awkward or inappropriate for me to look very angry or to look very upset instead, etc. And children and adults learn to use other people's emotional expressions to guide their behavior. We behave according to how other people uh, feel uh, around us. So emotion regulates social behavior. How I behave to you, towards you, how you behave towards each other depends on the emotions that each of you are expressing.